The Financial Sense Midweek Edition with Jim Paplava. Delving in-depth with authors and experts into the key economic issues. Joining me as my special guest today is Robert Hirsch. He co-authored the book, The Impending Energy Mess, what it is and what it means to you. And, Bob, I want to begin our discussion with a study that goes all the way back to 2005 that you did for the U.S. government. And you took a look at peak oil, and you said eventually we're going to be facing it. It's a matter of whether we plan for it 20 years in advance, which would be the best way to handle it, 10 years in advance, or the worst is to do nothing. So let's begin in terms of where you think we are in hitting the peak and where we are in terms of planning for it. What we did back in 2005 was take a look at the very best that the world could do in terms of mitigation, and that included technologies to cut back on the use of oil products, gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, and so forth, and also means for producing additional quantities of all of those petroleum products in order to make up for the decline in world production of petroleum. And what we found, as you indicated, is uh, the best bet would have been to start 20 years before the problem. Before the problem hit, starting 10 years beforehand would have been better than waiting till the last minute, and then, of course, we looked at the last minute. The way it appears now is that the world is moving towards the uh, option of facing the problem at the last minute. And I suppose that's not too surprising since there are a lot of other things going on now and people tend to wait until they can see a problem squarely. In terms of what we're talking about, uh, of course, is that oil is a finite resource and we've been producing it at a very high rate for a long time, and at some point a finite resource is uh, going to uh, begin to peter out. It won't disappear overnight, but it'll peter out. And it appears that we're within a matter of a few years of what I would call the decline of world oil production. So the conclusion from then and an updated version in our book is that We're staring this thing in the the face within a matter of years, and it will take us much more than a decade with a worldwide crash program, which is the best that you can do, a worldwide crash program to uh, try to mitigate the problem. So uh, even though we've got big issues in the world right now and people are concerned about the financial issues that uh, we're all well aware of, in fact, we've got something else coming in the not terribly distant future that's going to do additional economic damage, and it's going to it's really going to hurt, unfortunately. You know, Bob, I would argue that we're already seeing the impact of peak oil with the price and what it's done to economies. And I would go back to the beginning of this year when we had the Arab Spring, we had Libyan oil production taken offline, and we had West Texas Intermediate crude hit 115, and we had, of course, Brent almost at 130. At that same time that oil prices were hitting those levels, the price at the pump here in California was over $4, and immediately, and it's coincidental, but I've seen this happen in the past, the leading economic indicators began to roll over, the economy began to weaken, they began talking about a double-dip recession, economic growth around the globe also weakened as well, and then in May, we hit that peak in price, and from May, West Texas fell from 115 down to 75. Of course, Brent crude came down into the low uh, triple digits, and we began to see a pickup. Now, economies seem to be gathering steam again, and lo and behold, oil prices are, you know, on the day you and I are speaking, West Texas is at close to $100 a barrel. Brent's at close to $110 a barrel. So are we in some sense, already seeing the beginning signs of the peak because any time economic activity picks up, the first thing that rises is oil prices. 
Well, you're right. And, of course, the basis for that very simply is that robust economies or expanding economies require petroleum products, be it gasoline for people to move around in their cars or trucks, jet fuel to move more things and more people by uh, airplanes, uh, bunker fuel for ships and and so forth. So the demands uh, do indeed go up. One thing that I think everybody agrees to about oil prices being as high as they are now rather than the $20 a barrel of a decade ago is that the easy to find and produce oil is essentially been found and is being produced uh, now. And so we're into oil that is much more expensive to find and to produce in super deep water and, uh, and things that I'm sure your audience has heard about. So the easy stuff is effectively uh, found and or uh, gone, and the more difficult, more expensive uh, oil is uh, what's being pursued today. That means that oil is indeed more expensive and just fundamentally more expensive. The other thing that uh, somehow gets confused in all of this is that world oil production has been on a plateau. It's been basically flat with fluctuations since about the middle of 2004. And you remember that there were a number of good years in there when demands were uh, high and uh, economies were in much better shape. And even though oil prices went up for a considerable period of time, in fact, we didn't find that much more Finding does take some time. We didn't find that much more, and everything that we could do, in fact, didn't make any difference to world oil production. That, to us, who analyze things like this, is another indicator that we are close to the point when world oil production will go into decline. If you go back and look at uh, past recessions, uh, particularly uh, from uh, before the, the 1970s up until just recently, I think uh, all but one of the recessions that we've had was led off by uh, escalating oil prices. So there is a connection between high oil prices and economic well-being. It's a complicated subject. Hopefully those simple statements, I hope they're simple, will help people to maybe understand the situation a little bit better. Bob, if you look at the reports that came out last year, and there have been a number of them, they seem to have been ignored. The World Energy Outlook uh, just came out with the IEA, and they came out with some key points. Something that we just talked about, economic concerns have diverted attention from energy policy and limited the means of intervention. The MENA turmoil raised questions about the region's investment plans, But more importantly, energy efficiency of global economy worsened for the second straight year, and then spending on oil imports is near record highs. So things have not gotten better. Well, you're right. You you hit a number of uh, of very important points, and those are indicators of problems that uh, lie ahead. There's very strong feelings and uh, very significant stakes on the part of a number of organization and institutions on this whole issue. And unfortunately, uh, the oil industry, for reasons that are clear to it and not necessarily to those uh, outside of the uh, industry, uh, they don't want to talk about this at all. And recently, they've said that uh, you don't have to worry about peak oil because technology is going to take care of things. That's very interesting because it says that the industry is talking about peak oil and rather than trying to call it a humbug and push it under the carpet. And they're saying that technology is going to make a huge difference. I was in the business of developing upstream oil exploration and uh, production uh, technology, and so I understand it. I understand the progress that's been made, which is evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And I also understand a great deal about the geology, what oil does in rocks, because it doesn't sit underground in a pool. It sits in uh, in rocks. There are things you can do to coax more oil out of existing reservoirs. But in fact, most of the developed uh, companies that produce oil have been using those technologies for quite some time. What the oil industry is saying, that there's something either new 
If it is, I don't know what it is, and I doubt there's anything dramatically different because of the character of the uh, uh, the problem. And the other thing is that people have been practicing these evolving technologies for quite some time. So I think their argument uh, is getting a little strained in terms of them trying to not be the ones to declare that it's a problem in the future. Why are they doing this? Only they know. Speculation from the outside is they're scared to death of what's involved, and they don't want to be the ones that stand up and tell the world that there's a problem, because when the world recognizes, widely recognizes that there's a problem, there's going to be panic that takes place. You know, this raises a question, because despite some of these concerns that uh, you've addressed and others we keep getting reports, and especially, uh, Bob, you see this whenever there's a new discovery, whether it's off the coast of Brazil or off the coast of, uh, let's say, Texas. In fact, one individual, Daniel Jurgen, has just written a new book called The Quest, and he recently wrote an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal on, uh, you and I are having this conversation on a Tuesday, but on Monday, he wrote a piece called America's New Energy Security, where he talked about shale play. And he's talking about where we've gone from 200,000 barrels per day of production to a million barrels per day, and that we're going to reach 3 million barrels per day of production going forward. So, like, this was a major game changer. And in many ways, this kind of sort of substantiates his idea that, you know, peak oil is something we don't have to worry about for another couple decades. Well, Daniel Jurgen is an interesting guy, and he has steadfastly denied the existence of peak oil or, alternatively, has suggested that it's so far into the future that we don't have to worry about it. He's done this for a long, long time, and he's a very articulate guy. He's um, a history major, and I don't know necessarily what history has to do with geology, but... uh, Again, he's a smart guy, and I think he's learned a great deal uh, over the years. I think he's dead wrong. And most of the people that are soberly analyzing the situations uh, uh, like exist today believe he's dead wrong. And I don't know who pays him to do whatever it is he does. He's in the business of providing services, so he has clients that uh, pay him. I mean, he's got to agree with what it is uh, they feel. So that's a complicated thing, and, and as I said, all we can do is uh, kind of wonder what's uh, what's behind that. As far as uh, oil from shale is concerned, we've known about that for a very long period of time. Evolving drilling, horizontal drilling, and fracturing technology has made producing that oil from rocks that are very, very tight. In other words, uh, the oil has a great deal of difficulty moving between the small pores in in the rocks. We've known about that for a long time. The fact that technologies have evolved and, very importantly, that oil prices have come up as high as they have means that that kind of a resource can be produced, and that's certainly good news. I mean, that's good news no matter what. And, by the way, there's a bunch of folks up in the the region where this is, uh, Montana, North Dakota, and and so forth, where there's a lot of jobs, and these days jobs are a good thing. a little bit of an aside there. The point is, though, that sober people looking at at what's involved uh, indicate that we can indeed produce maybe a few million barrels a day. And again, that's good. I was just reading a Bernstein research report, a very comprehensive report on all of this, and they agree that indeed significant uh, amount of oil can be produced, maybe not three million, they say a million and a half, maybe two million. They're not in the propaganda business, they're in the financing business, so one has to assume that uh, uh, they're being uh, very sober about what it is they're doing. The thing that you have to realize is, and I know you do, Jim, is that because so many oil reservoirs are in declining production, that every year worldwide we, we lose something like 5 million barrels a day of production. And it's only because we're bringing some new fields on that we can make that up and we can keep this production plateau going, which is what we talked about earlier. 
So keeping in mind that we have four or five million barrels a day decline each year, a million and a half, two million take Jurgens, three million barrels a day is certainly good news, but it's going to all it's going to really do is help to make up for declines that are occurring worldwide otherwise. I know that's kind of long with it, and I apologize for that. But um, and we tried to explain these things more slowly in a book. But uh, uh, the point is that it's a very complicated process, and if you just think it, new production is a good thing. Yes, it's a good thing, but it not is not necessarily going to make up for the losses that are occurring worldwide. And yet, Bob, if you take a look at, of course, most leaders right now, especially Europe and here, are focused on the economy, re-election, the financial crises, and yet this is a bigger storm, and it can create and enhance the financial crises, which is something I don't understand that our present leaders have failed to comprehend. Because if you're trying to fix a debt problem, a debt problem, you know, is directly related to economic growth. If you have declining economic growth, in fact, there was a piece written on the oil drum pointing to this very issue that once you hit peak, and let's say that you start to decline in terms of production output by 1% or 2% a year, that in itself implies a slower economic growth or rate of growth and maybe a decline, which also raises debt issues, which also raises employment issues. So it seems to me that this whole financial crisis and peak oil are kind of linked at the hip because without increased energy production, what happens to the economy and what happens to all that debt? Well, I think you said it very well, and I hope your listeners uh, understand that it's complicated with all kinds of feedbacks that are difficult to understand. Uh, yes, of course, uh, this has incredible financial uh, implications. If you get down to the, the point of view of the individual who is listening to your program, what this means to them, independent of what their companies do, is it means that gasoline prices, instead of being 350 to $4 or, or, or maybe somewhat higher than that now, are very likely to be uh, closer to 8 or $10 a gallon. And furthermore, as the declines continue, there's going to be shortages. And so the gasoline or heating oil or what it is each of us uh, consumes as individual are going to be less and less available besides being very, very expensive. And if you think about that, if your readers and listeners uh, think about that and think of what that means not only to them but people who live further out uh, and have to drive a long ways to work, not being able to do that, that's a problem. And if you think about uh, the cost for industry to have to pay for more, and then you talk about also declining demand because of the financial issues which you talked about, it gets to be a spiral that is going to be very, very painful. And again, we looked at crash programs to see what the best you can do, and the best you can do is going to take a lot of years. And the reason for that, in the simplest terms I know, is that the problem is running away from you. It's got too much of a head start. So you've got to build up a lot of technologies and deploy them into a lot of things uh, as quickly as you can, but nevertheless, it's going to take you 10 years or more to catch up. And this is the thing about energy, Bob, is energy infrastructure, even a discovery of a new oil field, takes a considerable amount of time to bring into production. And not only that, if we were to change our current energy infrastructure, let's say that we wanted to, for example, electrify our transportation system, go to electric hybrids, plug-in hybrids, even our transport system from trucks to, to trains, all of that is going to take huge amounts of capital investment. It's going to take time to implement, and time seems to be something that we're running out of. And so I find surprising is, for example, our delay on the Keystone Pipeline, where we have 700,000 barrels of oil from a country that we get a large majority of our imports from, we seem to be turning away or we get caught in a system that we still do not have what I call a plan B. We do not have a credible energy 
plan or alternative, despite every president promising one since going back to President Nixon? Well, just to pick up on the Keystone thing, the decision to delay that is tragic. It's tragic on a major scale. Part of the reasoning, as I understand it, is that the politics of environmentalism is such that uh, people want to get rid of oil and get on to renewables. At some point, that's going to happen at some time in the future, but it's not happening quickly now. And if we don't get the pipeline built here so that we can take advantage of that oil, as you've uh, alluded to, then it's going to go someplace else, and that will make the situation for the United States even worse. Let me pick up on the word that you used, which gets so con- unfortunately confused, which again is, is very unfortunate. People talk about energy, and energy to a physicist or engineer has a very clean, clear meaning. But energy to the public gets all confused because people talk about wind power making up for declines in high prices of uh, gasoline and oil. That's just dead wrong in the short term in particular because the machinery that runs on oil products, gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, and so forth, is built to operate with that source. So windmills aren't going to do anything until you rebuild and replace a large fraction of that end-use equipment. So the thing that people don't take into account by thinking just energy is the type of energy that's required for that huge infrastructure of automobiles and trucks and buses and airplanes and ships and so forth that is built to operate on oil products. That's one of the things that a lot of people get confused about. And when we take a look at that, because anytime this is, of course, the election season, and I remember in the last presidential election, you prepared a peak oil summary sheet that you gave most of the candidates that were running at that time in both parties. And I think you mentioned only one or two paid much attention to it. Here we are again. We're going to have another presidential election And you do hear talks about more drilling. You hear talks from the president about green energy technology, solar and wind. But this is very confusing, as you pointed out, because you're not going to put a 747 in the air on wind or solar. And, you know, I don't know, maybe with technology of whether you can power big transport ships and send them across the ocean. I know you can do it on wind. We used to do it, but uh, we're far away from reaching that point from where we stand today. And behind all of this is a great deal of misunderstanding about energy, lack of in-depth appreciation for what's involved, and also, I think, a fear associated with the horrors that are really going to be associated with peak oil. It's one of those things where when people begin to think about it, first of all, they get confused because they don't have a background. Second of all, they grab something that somebody said that we can drill baby drill and drill our way out of this. Doing more drilling is going to be helpful, but it's against a declining availability of oil. And so, and if you think about it and get just scratch a little bit deeper into the subject, it's very grim. And I consider myself an optimist, Jim, and uh, but I'm also a uh, pragmatist. And uh, pragmatically, you've got to face up to problems if they're coming. And uh, if they're terrible, then you've got to spend more time to understand and try to do something about them. And uh, too many politicians, unfortunately, politicians on both sides of the aisle, have been misled or uh, don't really have an in-depth understanding. And the result is, and by the way, there's the squeaky wheel associated with the financial problems that are going on right now, and so people aren't paying attention. And we're going to hurt later on because of that inattention. You know, I almost see these two linked at the hip, Bob, because as we try to deal with these uh, debt problems, whether it's budget deficits, or financial debts of the banking system. All of this is predicated on a growth rate. In one of the studies that you did on peak oil, you talked about a decline in production and what it might imply for economic growth and also, let's say, the unemployment rate. 
And if we start to lose, let's say, I don't know, in the next couple of years, by 2015, if we start to see a decline in production of 1% or 2% a year, you're talking about a decline in economic activity, and you're also talking about a rise in the employment rate. And if there's anything that we could do to mitigate that, one would be to start expanding and working on the energy grid right now. Well, you're right. And, again, it's complicated, and uh, I can only wonder how your average listener is uh, reacting to what it is uh, we're talking about because it's complicated and it's very, very frightening. Yes, there are things that can be done. Yes, there will be industries that uh, build up to make liquid fuels, uh, oil products out of coal and out of natural gas and uh, more efficient automobiles. There's quite a few things that will happen and will flourish. On the other hand, relatively few people in the country are involved in the energy industry. So what's going to happen to the other folks is not going to be very good, and it's going to be bad, and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be hurt, unfortunately. If you take a look at what happened in the events that where we have history, where oil production and oil availability declined quickly, namely 1973 and uh, 1979, two instances where in a relatively short period of time period, oil availability dropped. What happened? Oil prices and gasoline prices and other prices ramped up dramatically. There were lines for people waiting in their cars to get gasoline, which you couldn't get on a regular basis. You had to stand, stand in line, pay high prices, and oftentimes couldn't get it. All of that, if you carry it through, which we tried to in our writings, if you carry it through means recession and a whole lot of unemployment and just a whole lot of pain that isn't going to go away very quickly. Again, it's, it hurts me. The first time I got into this business and began to realize what the implications were of this, I mean, it was very, very depressing. And past being depressed about it and trying to be part of the solution, but we're not making great headway in getting people to pay attention. And there's a lot of people and a lot of organizations that are trying to brush this under the rug, and, and folks have their various reasons for doing that. I think, to me, that's, uh, that's not a good thing. Bob, does the corporate world really understand this? I mean, you have Boeing that has orders for over 200 of its new Dreamliner, the, the 787, and I just wonder how many... 787s will be packed with passengers if we see a decline in production on an annual basis of, let's say, 1% or 2% a year. I can't imagine what that's going to do to the cost of travel or the price of jet fuel. Well, if you think about the recessions and the deepening recessions that are going to occur when oil production does go into decline, yes, there's going to be much, much less in the way of traveling for either business or pleasure, and it's going to be much more expensive because the fuel is going to be much more expensive. And then, of course, there's going to be shortages. I happen to know somebody that worked for Boeing and was deeply concerned about this problem, and he tried to get his management to pay attention to it, and they chose to not do it for whatever reason. Boeing is going to have a very serious problem, and from a financial investment standpoint, if you look around uh, at stocks that you may want to short when uh, this problem becomes widely known, it's going to be companies like Boeing that, uh, in fact, uh, one ought to take a serious look at. I know the the UK task force had, which was a, a private organization. You had Richard Branson, who obviously owns an airline, so I, he seems to get it and understand what may be coming. But I'm surprised we haven't seen more CEOs. And along those lines, Bob, was the um, Lloyds of London study they did with Chatham House that came out last June. And they basically said, look, the way the cost of energy is going, the insecurity of energy supply, if you want to be around for the next half of the new century, you better have a plan with coping with energy cost and energy productivity, or otherwise you're not going to be around. So at least there does seem to be certain organizations that are grasping what all this implies for the way we do business. Well, I've been in corporate life, along with uh, being in the government and also in the nonprofit sector, so I have some idea of uh, how people think. 
In the corporate sector, there tends to be, as you very well know, concentration on the short term and quarter to quarter because people pay attention to stock prices uh, in that way, as, as you know better than, uh, than most people. And to think about a huge problem coming down the pike that is, in fact, going to derail everything that you've been planning for and building towards and so forth, is a pretty horrible thought. And if you can look around and find some people that are also not worrying about it, you have the comfort of others being in the same boat, and so I suppose you can either personally or professionally excuse yourself. I don't tend to think that way. I tend to think in terms of being pragmatic. If there's a problem coming, you determine what the risks are, what the timescales are, and you look for uh, planning uh, bases that are robust against those things happening, either sooner or in the midterm or maybe a little bit later. Bob, you wrote a book with your associate, Roger Bezdek, and what you were trying to do with that book was sort of put this in understandable terms, and, and because we hear so many different, I guess, terms used to describe energy, and we have so many reports, like yesterday's op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, you know, today they're talking about, uh, boy, we could be energy independent here in the next couple of years, and it just doesn't equate with reality. If that was the case, I don't think you and I would be talking about $100 oil prices today. But tell our listeners a little bit more about your book, because you did an excellent job of putting this into perspective, and more importantly, laying out a plan of how you can prepare for it, and uh, not only from a personal point of view, but also investments, and then laying an outline of these are the things that need to be done. You and I have had some conversations on this subject, and I wonder how well our conversations, uh, as good as I think they are, and I hope that they're good, I wonder how that goes across with people. I know it's a difficult subject. I've been involved in energy my whole career in all dimensions of, uh, of energy, and when I got to this thing called peak oil, it took me considerable time to understand what was involved and why. And I had spent something like 15 years in the oil industry, so it shouldn't have been a shock, but in fact it was. What we tried to do in the book was to simplify it as much as we could so that the intelligent reader could get into it and hopefully get a number of these various forces and reality into some kind of meaningful perspective. And we tried to do it being somewhat technical, but trying to not be extremely technical. And again, we've gotten feedback that indicates that a number of people found that it was, uh, it was useful to them. The other thing that we did in the book is to take a look at other alternative energy sources for the longer term to produce electricity. There's nuclear power, there's wind, there's solar cells, and so forth. Every one of those technologies that are out there have shortcomings. Every one of them has shortcomings. And the decision that has to be made is which ones, because you're not going to do just one, which ones are you going to accept and promote, and what are you going to do to minimize the shortcomings that the ones you choose actually have. People need to understand that you can't just keep knocking off things and saying, I don't like oil, I don't like nuclear, I don't like this, I do like wind power. Oops, wind power kills a lot of birds, and the wind doesn't always blow, and I love solar cells, but the solar cells don't work at night and so forth. People are saying, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like, and they're not really looking at what's left and what the reality is of the things that are left. So people are being idealistic and simplistic simplistic on these things and unfortunately causing all kinds of problems in terms of our evolving and moving towards a more sustainable energy future. Well, one of the ways I think a lot of people can uh, maybe grasp or, or gain a better understanding is reading your book because I, I want to commend you for it because you you really took a lot of complex matters as it relates to energy because you know you hear these terms and you're hearing it in an election year green energy uh, wind solar all of this sounds wonderful when you hear it these are nice buzzwords but in terms of fixing the problem you know is another issue and i just want to invite those of you that are listening to this interview if you have a chance pick up a copy of bob's book the impending world energy mess what it is and what it means to you 
And Bob, just a final question. You were at this year's ASPO conference. What was the uh, tenor of the conference this year, given uh, the related matters that we've discussed during this interview today? Well, the ASPO, which is Association for the Study of Peak Oil, uh, is trying to spread a large tent, so they're bringing all kinds of different folks in. Things that stood out to me is that the people who are the serious analysts of world oil production have, in fact, gotten to the point, all of us have, that things haven't changed. In other words, what we concluded a few years ago, and for some people uh, quite a few years ago, none of that has changed. The geology, the reality of what this technology is and what oil production is just simply hasn't changed. And so we are marching towards the edge of the cliff. I hope that's not too extreme to say it that way. Other things, as people talked, there were a few people that talked about uh, renewables, and they were totally unrealistic. They have no idea of how the energy system works, and uh, some of it for me is, was particularly maddening because these people are talking seriously about something that they simply don't understand, but they are convinced that they do understand. There were some financial people there this year, and they were talking about the financial implications of various scenarios, and I found that to be very, very productive, and I found that there are more people in the financial industry that are paying attention to what's involved and I think are beginning to learn uh, about what's involved. So uh, it was a good meeting in a number of respects. There were a few maddening things, but so what? Because there are some people that are just grossly uh, misinformed. And uh, I hope that uh, what it is you've been doing and uh, what others have been doing will help people to become informed because the society in the United States is headed for serious trouble. One of the things that we did in the book was to try to outline to people what's likely to happen, why we think it's likely, and what people can do to protect themselves. And the final analysis, I guess I care about people as well as the country, which is made up of people. Well, unfortunately, I think that's what the solution seems to be, is that individuals need to take a look at this, assess the issues. I guess maybe, uh, like you, Bob, I've become somewhat of an optimist, because I think it's a problem that we can solve with time, but, you know, to solve a problem, you have to recognize you have one, but you have people like Chris Martinson out there talking about this with the crash course. You have uh, large fund managers like Jeremy Grantham, who's picked up on resource scarcity, So as more and more people pick up on the idea, and I I think that one comforting thing is if you Google the term peak oil today, there's a lot more items out there on peak oil compared to where it was 10 years ago. So it's certainly gaining at least more traction in certain areas of the world. But unfortunately, I I think like the late Matt Simmons once commented, last time I talked to him is he basically said, Jim, I think it's going to take a series of major crises that hit us before we really take this seriously. And I'm afraid, Bob, that's where we're heading. Well, there's the old story about hitting the mule with a two-by-four to get his attention, and you just said it. Uh, so I, I agree. It's. I just wish that we could do better because we are intelligent beings and uh, we can think ahead and we can educate ourselves. And uh, I hope some of your audience pay attention to what it is you've been doing, what it is we've been trying to do, what other people have been trying to do, and pay attention and protect themselves, and then beyond that, there are going to be opportunities.